the defendant is not guilty. Got my life back. Not guilty. The officer who never went in. Standing still while other officers rushed in. Could have taken 10 steps forward. Could have been a hero. Never closure for Douglas High families who want accountability. His inaction contributed to the shock and devastation. It just shows that he valued his life over the life of the people on the third floor. Did jurors get it right? Police officers are sworn to protect and serve. They are not what I would believe is defined in the statutes in Florida as a caregiver. The layers of the law. <laughs> Supreme opinions, national debate, and one that may chart the course of your vote. New Florida laws and one for medical marijuana rights a racial wrong. The big news of the week, all live this week in South Florida. Great to have you aboard this Sunday morning. I'm Glenna Milberg. This week, a South Florida jury verdict for one man, in his words, gave him his life back, though it took the collective breath away for dozens of others. The jury found former school resource officer Scott Peterson was not guilty of child neglect for failing to enter the 1200 building at Stoneman Douglas High while a shooter was in the process of killing those inside. Apparently, this was a first of its kind case, and the verdict may make it the last. Of the families living with profound loss, several were there in the gallery and shared heartfelt and heartbreaking reactions publicly in the moments that followed both the verdict and Peterson and his attorney celebrating their win in front of them in that hallway. The case highlighted essential questions brewing for the last five years in the layers of negligence involved in that mass murder. The school resource, resource officer did not go in, but Douglas High coach Chris Hickson did go in and died a hero that day. Tom Hickson is one of his sons with us right there today from his home in Tampa. Tom, it is so great to see you and thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for having me, Glenna. So you were here for the sentencing of the shooter. You actually spoke at the sentencing phase. Um, you were not here. You were home for uh, Scott Peterson's trial and the verdict. So, so what, what are your thoughts as you watched from Tampa? Yeah, I mean, as you know, many of the other families and other people have said, you know, it's just a continuation of the, the lack of accountability that's come out of this whole entire tragedy. Uh, you know, especially in the case of Peterson, you know, as a law enforcement officer, you know, he knows every day that he's putting on that badge to go into work, that he took an oath to put his life on the line for others. And the fact that he refused to do so based on the gray area of some policy uh, and not even enter the building to even assess the situation, you know, like you mentioned that my dad did, you know, as soon as he heard the gunshots, he ran in, not knowing what was going on either. Uh, so for Peterson to neglect to do that, I think, was the, the precedence for this case. So, you know, um, you're talking from the heart and you are saying what so many of the families have said. There are those who are very vocal. I think it's of the families who have shared publicly across the board. There is just frustration and heartbreak again. And and in your words, you know, another another lack of accountability moment. However, the law, the charges, the actual legal charges of child neglect, I think from the get-go, even the prosecutors knew that that was going to be a pretty steep climb. So, so can you, in your mind, separate the, the actual legal process that just occurred from what the decision Scott Peterson might have made in that moment that, that really have no legal standing? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I'm no legal expert myself. Uh, but, you know, like I mentioned, you know, just in the the oath and the duties of a law enforcement officer, uh, you know, as you know, you mentioned or had the voiceover talking about protect and serve, you know, that's the motto of law enforcement officers uh, protect right there is the first one. Uh, so in the case of Scott Peterson to not go and protect whether it's children, whether it was the teachers, uh, you know, my father, all the students, whoever it might have been, you know, it, it's it's right there uh, and he failed to do so. And I think that is what set up the the legal precedent that, you know, he was neglecting to protect these children uh, as well as the teachers within the building. 
you, how much you, did you watch the trial at all? I don't want to ask you things that you might not have seen. But did you, did you actually watch the trial? Honestly, I've, I've just followed up, you know, kind of at the end of the day as stuff was going on, reading articles, uh, you know, to me, uh, personally watching this case, uh, we, we kind of felt that, you know, it probably wasn't going to go anywhere. Uh, and, you know, we just weren't trying to get in that mental space. And for myself, you know, I have a, a now three month old son that I'm kind of focusing on. In interesting that you said you did not think it was going anywhere. Why? Why was that? Uh, I mean, we had, you know, kind of been prepared, you know, when they when they brought the case up uh, to be completely transparent. Uh, but, you know, we, we obviously wanted something to happen, but like we said, you know, we just, we haven't seen accountability happen on pretty much any front since the entire legal process for anything coming out of this tragedy has happened. So, you know, some of us, our hopes probably weren't very high to begin with. You know, I, you, you are a, a military family. You have served this country. Your dad served the country. Um, we learned collectively so much more about him than we ever knew about him as a coach at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. And, uh, and I guess that's kind of human nature um, in a, in a post-mortem way. We really honor and appreciate what your dad has done, not only for the country, but for the school. We learned so much about what happened that day uh, in 2018, not only from the trials that we've watched, but from the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Public Service Commission, Public Safety Commission, excuse me, and, um, and the investigations going in. And we have video to see exactly what transpired during the shooting and after. I'm not sure if we have that video that we can air while we talk right now, but we learned that through testimony that the school personnel knew where the shooter went in the door. There were two safety, uh, safety patrol officers in a golf cart who picked Scott Peterson up when all of this happened and, and took him to the 1200 building. And yet during the trial, he said he was unsure where the shots were coming from. Um, instead of going in the door of the 1200 building, as your dad did, we watched him not open the door, take cover, protect himself. He was not wearing a bulletproof vest. So all of this is on video for us, for the jury to see. I, I want to get your perspective on a school resource officer on any given day saying that he just didn't really know in that moment, almost like the fog of war. He just didn't know. Yeah, I mean, like you said, you know, there was there was ample evidence of, you know, the fact that shots were happening in the 1200 building, whether or not he knew which floor the shooter exactly was on at the time. Uh, like you said, you know, he had gotten calls, he had gotten reports, uh, you know, he knew my dad had probably ran in at that point. Uh, you know, I haven't heard any of the, the radio transmissions that might have transpired uh, at that point. But again, you know, just as a law enforcement officer, whether it's an SRO or any other cop or law enforcement officer, you know, working in the profession, you know, you have to have this bias for action when something does happen. And the fact that he didn't have that to even step foot in the building, as you mentioned, to assess where the shooter was, because that's information that could have been relayed to Coral Springs or any other BSO officers who had showed up. So that way they didn't set up and sit outside as well, waiting to figure out what was going on. Uh, so, you know, as the first person on the scene, as the first law enforcement officer on the scene, he had to have that that bias for action and that that moral and ethical responsibility within himself to go in and assess that situation to that way hopefully prevent uh, any further loss of life. In the hallway, Scott Peterson said that he would be happy to sit down and, and talk with the families. Would you have any interest of that? Uh, at this point, uh, most likely not, uh, especially for us. It's probably going to be uh, a little bit more painful just because of the fact that my dad did know Scott. Uh, uh, fairly well, you know, as a campus monitor and with Scott being the SRO, you know, they had a pretty good relationship. So it would probably just be a little bit too painful for us personally. Um, I hope it is not too painful if I play when we come back from this break a little bit about what he said in the hallway, because I think people will be really interested to hear what you think about his reaction. So um, if you can stay with us for a couple of minutes and we will be right back.
We are back with Tom Hickson, whose dad, Chris, was one of the 17 victims that day at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High. Uh, talking about the Scott Peterson trial, Scott Peterson, the former school resource officer who did not go in, who was charged as a criminal, who was acquitted this week. Uh, Tom, Scott Peterson in the hallway giving interviews, very emotional for him. He did not testify during the trial in his own defense. Uh, I guess his attorney thought he didn't have to after the prosecutor's case, but he did say a lot in the hallway, and um, I would like to just play a little clip for anyone who didn't see, and we can talk about that. Got my life back. We got our life We've back. We've got our finally. life back after four and a half years. Five and a half. Because of Mark. It's been an emotional roller coaster for so long. Endless nights. Don't anybody ever forget this was a massacre on February 14th. The only person to blame was that monster. It wasn't any law enforcement. You know what I tell the families? I would love to talk to them. No problem if they need to really know the truth of what occurred and not only my actions, but what occurred, I'm there for them. Tom, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I mean, he can say that he has his life back, but honestly, you know, court of public opinion has probably other things to say about that. Uh, I mean, he still has to live with the fact of what he did or in fact did not do that day. Uh, so while legally he may have his life back, I think, you know, personally, emotionally, morally, I think his his life is for the most part over in those senses. Hmm. His attorney said something in the hallway I'd like to run by you. Um, not, a, not a lot has been said about this, and I've been very curious as to what the families thought about. He said, um, and this is a quote, I wrote it down verbatim, how dare prosecutors try to second guess the actions of honorable, decent law enforcement officers? Second guessing the action of a law enforcement officer um, and, and for the record, we think all are honorable, honorable and respectful, and we honor our law enforcement officers. But second guessing anyone with a position of authority is is kind of part of the democratic process. Um, I wonder what you think about what his attorney said. No, yeah, I mean that's absolutely the case. I mean they should definitely be respected and you know given credit for the profession that they chose to enter, but they also like I said, they need to understand the weight that comes with that that profession and that responsibility of putting on that badge and that uniform every day uh, as a law enforcement official. So they're they're not above reproach, just like military veterans are not above reproach. We have we can certainly make our own mistakes and we should be held accountable for them. And that should uh, spread out to every aspect of our society, regardless of position. Are you are you um, on a day to day basis? Do you consider, I, I guess that my question is, I'm, I'm having difficulty really finding the words to ask this as very respectfully as I want to. I, I want to know how much of the layers of negligence that we now know have occurred are with you in your thoughts every day and maybe in your actions every day from the missed signals in the history of the shooter to to frankly botched FBI tips that went nowhere, an unlocked fence at Marjory Stoneman Douglas that day. How much of these layers of negligence are, are top of mind for you? Uh, I mean, honestly, every single one of them uh, really does weigh on us when we think about, you know, what happened that day. And, you know, even if only one thing had been different, you know, it might have changed the outcome in substantial ways. Uh, so for the fact that every single one of those things happening uh, just made this tragedy that much worse. Uh, so yeah, that, that layering effect just makes it so much, so much more uh, waiting on us and our consciences and our thoughts, you know, just thinking about our loved ones who are lost. And, you know, like you said, you know, just even going back to the very beginning of, you know, just a culture around firearms that, you know, the shooter had manifested and, you know, if you want to get into it about, you know, the direction our country's going in our culture about firearms, uh, you know, that really was probably the catalyst, but all the other layers and things that just weren't done properly really just accelerated, you know, essentially metaphorically the fire of, of what happened. And, and in that hallway, Scott Peterson's team actually blamed former Broward Sheriff's uh, 
Broward Sheriff, former Broward Sheriff Scott Israel, who um, who actually took a lot of blame, was suspended by the governor, lost his job over this. But in that hallway, they blamed Scott Israel for raising the specter of using Tom Peterson as a uh, Scott Peterson as a scapegoat. Does that resonate with you? Was was he a scapegoat? Actually, it was the, when, when you really get technical, it was the governor who, who really raised the issue of Scott Israel and training and Scott Peterson's training and the fact that all of that led to it. So does that resonate with you at all? I mean, it does. I mean, I don't think scapegoat is, is the right word by any means. Uh, you know, you can definitely blame you know, the organization itself of BSO on however it conducted its training and wrote its policies at that time in 2018 and before. Uh, but like I said before, you know, at the end of the day, you know, as a law enforcement officer, you have that responsibility to protect and serve. Uh, you have the moral and ethical duty to act, you know, whether it's written in a policy that you don't have to act and you're protected legally from it, morally and ethically, you know, as someone in that profession, you have to act, you have to have that bias for action, you have to have that initiative, and you have to go in and do whatever you can, uh, you know, in the sense of that you are willing to give your life in this in this process and in this job. So in the short time we have together, wh what would accountability look like to you? Honestly, at this point, uh, I really don't know what else, you know, we could really look for in accountability. Uh, you know, we, we've tried so many different avenues at this point to get accountability uh, from BSO, from, you know, FBI, from uh, school board, uh, from individuals themselves. And I mean, it's it just goes where it goes based on the legal process. And I'm I'm more than willing to accept what the, the legal outcomes are. But I just think uh, these people who failed definitely have to live with that guilt every day of knowing what their actions cause. Uh, and harm to others and our families. Tom Hickson, we value you and your family, your mom, Debbie, who is a Broward School Board member now and all the families yeah. doing their part to build a legacy for, for all of the families at Douglas High. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, and that's all we can do is just build legacies at this point. Yes. Thank you. And up next, the court of public opinion versus the court of law. We look at the difference between the two by revisiting predictions from the veteran prosecutor about Scott Peterson's case. Stay tuned. The trial of Scott Peterson, the Douglas High officer who did not go in, is a window into how different the rules are between the court of public opinion and the court of law. We saw a preview of that a few months ago on this program when a veteran prosecutor previewed this case actually arguing for the defense. That veteran prosecutor is back with us today. Gail Levine right there on Zoom with us. Gail, great to have you back. Thanks, Jenna. Thanks for having me this morning. Um, so I want I went and looked at our interview from a couple of months ago, and you said a law enforcement officer is not typically considered a caregiver. You set up that hill that prosecutors were trying to climb. You ended up being spot on. Take us through that. Well, uh, I think I was spot on because I really didn't just think about the court of public opinion or the court of law. I looked at all of the facts and that's what the jury was supposed to do. So before I get even further, let me just say this as a prosecutor that handled mostly murder cases, victim family of violent crime never ever recover. And my heart goes out to every victim of violent crime and particularly in this case to those victims at Marjorie Stoneham Douglas and their families. Now, the problem with their thoughts and emotional thoughts of other teachers or people in the community is that those people are not looking objectively at what a law enforcement officer is required to do. So when the jury received the facts, the evidence and the law, they were able to decipher not what people like emotionally, not what they want to happen, but what did and should have. So that's what I tried to do a couple of weeks back when I did some research and I tried to figure out 
what an officer's responsibility was. I think that the state attorney's office really failed to do that. And I was disappointed that they went forward with that prosecution because in a way it makes prosecutors look vengeful. And uh, they weren't, they were trying to do their job. I'm not saying that any of those prosecutors themselves were vengeful, but I'm saying that the public doesn't get the full flavor. Uh, they didn't have maybe the opportunity like I did to, to watch live stream and watch the, um, the testimony and to really see everything that the jury heard. So and that's the problem. Yeah, and, and really that speaks to every single criminal case that's in every single court because have, having had jury experience, the jury sometimes does not know what the public knows because it's not brought in as evidence. Um, but I wanna, I wanna ask you this to your point. So Scott Peterson had active shooter training as part of his training at Broward Sheriff's. There was during the trial, one of the trainers came in to testify that he was trained to go in. That was his training, that was the testimony. He did not go in. The charge was as a caretaker. Do you see another statute, another way to levy a charge against a law enforcement officer who does not do what he or she is trained to do? So I, I don't think, and I take issue with, I guess what that trainer said, because really what the trainer left out was what did the training say? It didn't say drop everything and run towards something you don't know what is going on. It said, if that was the training, everybody would just run to sounds. Confront I, the shooter. That. He was trained to confront the shooter. But he had to know where he was. And he didn't have any sense of that. Neither did anyone else around him. Well, so let me, let me that, just, um, what, what we know, what we know, is that there was at least one security guard who watched the shooter go into the 1200 building. Two security guards took Peterson in their golf cart to the building. Another, eventually, Coral Springs officers ran into the building. So there, there was evidence that refutes that, although did the jury hear that? That I don't know. Yeah, and, and also, you're also taking pieces of video and putting them together but are you really looking at them in a timeline or are you looking at them as a monday morning quarterback and i'm not saying you glenna i'm saying the, the public you have to see what it was in real time um i've heard some conversation that said oh you know if he just ran in somebody could have been able to close the door shoulda woulda coulda he had to know where the shooter was coming from and the one thing that i think is really important is we keep using the word accountability and everybody throws around Scott Peterson's name, but nobody wants to name the person who's accountable. And it's Nicholas Cruz. I said it. Well, I, I think that's been, we've been talking, you know, we've been reporting for five years about the shooter oh, who's responsible. Most sure. definitely. But, but at this point, it seems like he could have single-handedly taken him down. And that just isn't real. He's not Superman. So is he this was trained to go in at a certain time? Broward Sheriff's Department had a terrible radio system. Coral Springs was receiving the 911 calls. They knew where the kids were. They knew where the teachers were. There was no connection between the two of them. So if you looked at everything in time as to what he knew and what he saw, you come up probably with the same evidence and the same verdict as that jury. So it sounds like he, he himself and really investigations and reporting do raise questions about who knew what when. So the standard is reasonable doubt. So are, are, you're saying that all of these things or, or any one of them could raise that reasonable doubt standard that would not allow the jury to fill out those forms in any other way? Well, I don't believe that the, tes that the testimony or the evidence rose to the level that he was guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. That's the standard, beyond a reasonable doubt. And he was not, they found that he wasn't. Now, civilly, was there, was there problems? Yes. Um, I, I don't practice civil law. I know a little bit about it, but you only need about 51% to say somebody was wrong. Beyond a reasonable doubt is an abiding conviction of guilt. That is where your belief doesn't waver or vacillate. 
that you know exactly what you're determining. It's a very, very high standard. So could Broward County Schools, could the Broward Sheriff's Department been responsible civilly? May, probably likely. Do remember though, they have sovereign immunity and you know, they're uh, capped at $200,000. So, I mean, it, civil, civil really wasn't gonna get them where they needed to be. You know, they wanted, they wanted something to hang their hat on. And unfortunately, it, it just wasn't gonna be Scott Peterson when you have that many people failing at that level. Should Peterson have taken the stand at all in his own defense? That's a very personal decision that a defendant spends a lot of time with uh, their counsel. Um, I think that Mr. Peterson was an emotional guy and I don't know, maybe they took into account that his emotions could have gotten the best of him and he couldn't have followed the questions because he was so upset. You saw him when the reading of the verdict, he was hysterical. I've watched first degree murderers accept verdicts and not shed a tear. I've watched people be found not guilty, not shed a tear. This man was overcome with emotion. Yeah. It was painful. So I think that maybe he and his counsel felt, listen, the state just, not, does, just does not have proof beyond a reasonable doubt that he was responsible and that he was a caregiver. Food, clothing, all of that stuff, shelter, that's what a caregiver does. And that's not what we want our police to do. Otherwise, like I said before, they just walk into our house without a search warrant and nobody wants that. What is so interesting talking to you about this case is I feel like I'm talking to, you know, the prosecutor for the defense, which is a really nice uh, <laughs> objective view for everybody. Gail Levine, thanks so much. Appreciate you Thank hustling you. to be with us today. You're welcome anytime. <laughs> All right, next. The Supreme Court decision this week that is not making big headlines, but could make big changes in the way you vote in the 2024 elections. A roster of Supreme Court decisions this week dominated headlines and spurred debate about affirmative action, discrimination in free speech, and student loan forgiveness. An opinion involving who has ultimate control over elections got far less attention, but does have major implications for the balance of power. And it is a case from North Carolina, but what could it mean for Florida? We take that question to this veteran of election law, J.C. Planis. So much fun to have you right here at the table with us. Oh, I think it's good you. afternoon now. It's not good morning. Oh. Good you are absolutely right. Yeah. Good afternoon. So take us through this opinion, which essentially says that state courts can now check state lawmakers yes. in election law. And, and all courts, really. And this is a precedent that's existed. I mean, what was that question even? What was the question? So what, what happened was this was the third redistricting case they had. We had one in Alabama. We had one in Louisiana. And this was a North Carolina case. And it sort of bounced back and forth within the courts. But when it got to the U.S. Supreme Court, Republicans in North Carolina used what's called the independent state legislature theory. And all that is really is saying, we're the legislature. Nobody can tell us what to do. The state courts can't review us. The federal courts can't review us. We have the power to do anything regarding elections because of something that's in the United States code. So the way they were saying this was, even in not just in the case of redistricting saying they can't be reviewed by anyone but in a presidential election theoret theoretically they could have ignored the results of the elections in their state and given presidential electors to anyone they wanted which right now in the news is something that would have been be happening chaos. so so redistricting i mean th this we have a very engaged intelligent audience on this program everyone pretty much knows redistricting and it just happened in mm -hmm. florida so connect this what what could this case mean for florida where redistricting the latest maps is in the court right now. Well, you have to combine it. Number one, this court says that, you know, this the redistricting map can be reviewed by the courts, this decision. But we also had 
uh, decisions from the U.S. Supreme Court in Alabama and Louisiana where they struck down congressional maps that watered down African American and minority representation. Which is the Voting Rights Act. Exactly. Okay. And the interpretation right. of the Voting Rights Act saying you cannot draw a map that basically is going to take away voting power from pockets of minority communities. Well, in Florida, we had an African-American congressional district in the north part of Florida. District 5. Al Lawson was mm -hmm. the, the member of Congress that represented that area. And originally, the, the state house and the state senate created a district that preserved Al Lawson. The governor vetoes it and basically tells the legislature, this is my map, approve it. Never in Florida history had a governor vetoed a congressional map. But there is a state constitutional amendment saying you can't bring in politics into redistricting. And that's where the problem is with that seat. And this, this case makes it very hard to keep our current maps. So what happens, practically speaking, because <clears throat> reporting on the redistricting, it wasn't about politics and race, according to those who approved eventually the governor's maps. So right. now that it's in the court, that's for another court to decide yes. whether or not to redo these. But practically speaking, we're all going to the polls in the not too distant future. Mm -hmm. um, we've already been to the poll. Th those congressional maps in Florida are in place. Um, gave the Florida delegation a 20 Republican to eight Democrat split. Mm -hmm. So those are already in effect. Practically speaking, what happens? Well, the court is still looking at this case, the state court. Um, there is probably like a 50-50 chance that they will finish it by the time of qualifying for Congress. We don't know. Courts can take their time. There could be now a, a you know, this case could move faster now because of this decision, and we could see changes before the 2024 election. But those changes have to be done by the legislature. Courts have drawn maps before. So there's been different cases of redistricting. Number one, where the court sends it back to the legislature and orders a special session. You know, if the case moves now, we still have this session coming up in January of 2024. But it's so many, close. I know. It just ended. Yeah. <laughs> but in many cases, the courts have drawn the maps themselves. And we've seen that in the last redistricting in Florida the Florida Supreme Court drew the congressional map. And now the Florida Supreme Court is... Is different. Different. It's a different political makeup than the last time. Um, it has flipped politically. But again, now the U.S. Supreme Court is entitled to review decisions of state Supreme Courts. So you know what was so interesting? All the... We were talking before the program and that the, the decisions that came out of the Supreme Court this week are, are so politically charged and mm -hmm. such debate and sucking up all the oxygen out of every newscast, especially nationally, um, six to three decisions, conservative, liberal decisions. This particular elections decision in Moore versus Harper, the North Carolina case, mm -hmm. was a 6-3 yes. decision, but not in a conservative way. It was a very balanced way. Yeah. We had Kavanaugh, uh, Amy Coney Barrett, and the Chief Justice Roberts voting with the three liberal members of the court, sort of Mayor Kagan and Jackson. And what does that say to you? To you as a former Republican who is now a Democrat? I think, number one, the court is not going to give up its power. When you look at this North Carolina decision, and they, they cited even the most famous case that you learned the first week at law school, Marbury versus Madison, that shows that the courts can review, and, and in fact, even seniors, in, in government classes, no Marbury versus Madison, and it sets the precedent for courts reviewing decisions from the political branch. The court was not gonna give up their power. They were going to say, we are the arbiters, we've been the arbiters since this decision, and we are going to continue to be the arbiters of these type of cases. Why, here, one of the things that I, you know, my mind asks weird questions <laughs> while I read, and one of them was, why is this even a case when the Constitution has a balance of power mm -hmm. between lawmakers and the judiciary, especially, and the executive branch? Why is it even a question whether courts can review laws? It, it wasn't. And in fact, when they draft up the Constitution... Is that elementary? Was that too elementary? No, no, okay. no, no. <laughs> when they draft up the Constitution, there's the three equal branches of government, but it never mentions, just like the Constitution doesn't mention that a president can veto a bill, veto doesn't appear in the Constitution, the fact that the Supreme Court and the courts can review 
actions of the legislature and the legislative branch does not appear. So we have a common law system that we actually brought from England. A lot of things people don't realize. Some cases from old England are still good law in the United States. You know, you know I'm thinking maybe we have a segment on this week in South Florida. We bring <laughs> professors in and kind of give us like a little lesson that day. That that was really, it's very interesting. And you look very professorial Thank today, you. Mr. Attorney. Um, JC Plan, it's great to have you. Always I hope you'll be back. Here. Thank you. To hold class. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right, up next, hundreds of new state laws take effect this weekend, and among them, righting a racial wrong in medical marijuana industry. Stay tuned. Florida's medical marijuana industry is a boon to the businesses that score coveted state licenses, but there is a glaring disparity in the number of those awarded to African-American businesses, and one of the laws taking effect this weekend was amended to change exactly that. Senator Tracy Davis, Democrat from Jacksonville, was one of the lawmakers involved with that and is right here with us via Zoom. Senator Davis, great to see you. Same here, same here. I'm great, great to be here. So this law that the governor signed on Monday was about expanding telemedicine for medical marijuana yes. patients, but this amendment vaulted this up into the big news category, hence you're here with us. A explain how, how that amendment and, and the context of it is in this law now. So that amendment was a lot of uh, behind the scenes conversation. And Aren't they I, all? I, <laughs> um, because all of it happened like in the, the last three days of session, it was really an exciting session because we saw that coming to life. But um, I have a constituent here in Jacksonville and her grandmother is actually an, an original applicant and she's a Pickford and she's actually 100 years old. And so like the other applicants, the application was denied. And so my my fight became, hey, you know, this 100 year old and her family um, is a part of this. And, and we don't have a lot of time with this 100 year old. So I need to see something happen for these black farmers to be a part of this medical marijuana treatment center licensing. And so that was kind of the back, back and forth behind the scenes and just so excited that we now have the potential for um, 11, potentially 12 applicants to be able to apply for this uh, marijuana license um, and have a 90 day cure to fix the application. So you said she was a Pigford and I'm guessing there are a lot of people who are thinking, what's a Pigford? So Pigford <laughs> versus Glickman. Pigford versus yes, Glickman, well, what was that? 25 years ago, the federal case yeah. that was settled um, yeah. alleging that there was racial discrimination in the USDA. And so yes. how, how does that case apply to this now new law and potentially dozen, a dozen black farmers getting this medical marijuana license? How, what's the connection there? So, so thank you for saying that. This was um, an onset, an offset of a discrimination lawsuit um, with the USDA some, you know, 20 years ago. And so they identified a class of people that are called the Pig for Black Farmers from the Pigford versus Glickman lawsuit. And so fast forward, here we are, um, the Pickford uh, Black Farmers are, are an identified class in our state law. And so they are granted one medical marijuana treatment center license in our state law. The law we just, our, our governor just signed on Monday is now allowing for the last Pickford round of applicants, which were 12, to now be able to cure their deficiencies within a 90 day window to be able to receive a license from the Department of Health. When Florida uh, voters approved med medical marijuana, what was it, 16, 2016? Yeah. Yes, um, yes. There, the licenses that were um, dispensed in the year after as the structure of the industry was being framed out, why weren't any of the licensees black Floridians, why? Wow, this is this is this is vertical integration here in in Florida. So it is a very very expensive uh, mode of being a part of this medical marijuana industry. A person has to be able to provide or pay for or produce marijuana from what the structure is called seed to sale, and that is a very expensive 
way to do business. And most of our, honestly, African-American um, people um, cannot afford to do business like that. We don't have the funding. And so, you know, not having the funding and only having one license granted to this particular class of people, um, it takes a lot of money to get in this industry. And but yet with this law being in place, we now have that opportunity. And when these folks applied, um, originally it was a $60,000 application fee. Wow. These Pigford folks now have to pay $146,000 just for the application fee. So it's a very, very expensive business to be a part of. And do they now have, aside from that whopping application fee, do they have the resources to build that seed to sale vertical business you're talking about? And so that, and yes, the answer to that is yes. Um, believe it or not, some of them, that was probably, uh, that was a deficiency according to the Department of Health in a number of the applications. But with this law in place, they have the ability to now um, another 90 days to um, provide evidence that they have that funding to be able to um, enter into this medical marijuana industry, as well as the time to um, cure any of the other deficiencies they had. Um, th this is a need to, you know, simply right or wrong. This has been an effort that we've been fighting for, like you said, since 2017. So these people know just how close they are to walking through that door of being a part of this medical marijuana industry. So they're doing absolutely everything they need to, to be a part of this industry. Yeah, and you know, it it really can't go without saying that this comes in the context of a session where the governor and conservative legislature did away with what is now known as DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion programs for their own reasons. But this, um, what is what does that say to you? You know, there was a question mark for a long time. We we knew we had gotten this bill to the governor's desk on Thursday. Um, we we end session on Friday, so there has been a lot of holding of the breath and just maintaining um, a stealth mode because there has been a number of legislative attacks um, on on different groups, whether it's medical groups, um, our trans community, our African-American studies program, like you said, the diversity, equity, and inclusion programs. And it's just been a lot of, lot of attacks and fear here throughout Florida. So to have the governor actually sign this bill on Monday was a true surprise and um, pleasure for us all, but we still have work to do. Still have work to do. That That's sort of the headline we come with every day on every single subject. <laughs> Senator Tracy Davis, great to have you. Um, I learned a lot today from you, and that's uh, some interesting history. I hope you'll be back and talk about uh, the progress. I, I absolutely will, and I love the last session with uh, JC. I, that was very interesting, so <laughs> yeah, I'll just be we, back to hear you guys chop it up with that. We had we held court here today, did we not? <laughs> All right, <laughs> yes, thanks did. again. <laughs> All right, we will be right back. Rewatch any of today's interviews or listen to our podcast. All you have to do is scan this QR code with your phone and it takes you right to the This Week in South Florida section of Local10.com. We love to hear what you think about anything you saw today, anything in the news. You are such a big part of this program. Please do connect with us on social media. Easy to follow at Glenna WPLG, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thanks so much for spending the hour with us. Have a great Sunday.